What is presbyopia? Vision defects significantly affect our quality of life and, without proper correction, constitute an obstacle to performing many activities. With age, the adaptive abilities of the eyeball deteriorate and cause loss of visual acuity, turning into presbyopia. This defect affects people over 40 years of age and involves a weakening of the ability to change the optical power of the human eye. In this guide, we answer the question of what presbyopia is, what its typical symptoms are and how to treat it. Presbyopia, or presbyopia, is a natural process resulting from the aging of the human body. It appears in people over 40 years of age. And statistics show that almost everyone over the above-mentioned age suffers from it. It manifests itself in the fact that the ability to see objects up close decreases. The distance of the visible objects must increase, more and more over time. In order to see details, small elements of objects, or, for example, letters in a book. The adaptation mechanism responsible for this process is a change in the optical power of the eyeball, which is caused by the action of muscles on the lens of the human eye, explains Professor Richard Naskretke. Research shows that almost every person over 40 years of age suffers from presbyopia, although 90% of them have no idea about it. In Poland, we rarely use glasses or lenses that correct this defect. In America, about 30% lenses sold are those that correct presbyopia. For comparison, in Poland it is only a few percent, which may mean that we are a society unaware of the problem. Presbyopia is a defect that most often manifests itself in blurred images, burning eyes, and sometimes even periodic conjunctivitis. Such vision problems may also contribute to the occurrence of frequent headaches. Presbyopia reduces the quality of life, causing reluctance to read, perform activities that require intense eyesight, and often manifests itself in fatigue and deterioration of mood. A properly selected correction can significantly improve our willingness and enthusiasm for duties and increase our results at work. Treatment of presbyopia should start with a visit to an optical office, where the optometrist will select the right glasses or corrective lenses that will improve vision at close distances. This problem affects a huge number of people, although few of them actually realize it and seek specialist help. Inappropriately selected glasses purchased in non-specialized places may only worsen the situation, increase discomfort, and even contribute to further deterioration of vision. Therefore, it is important to be aware of what presbyopia is, how it manifests itself and how to treat it. Tests performed by optometrists can confirm the presence of presbyopia. And the specialists themselves will best help us correct this defect with properly selected glasses or lenses. Scientists have grown antlers on the head of mice. Deer antlers grow back rapidly, up to about 3 cm a day. This process has fascinated scientists for years. 
If the mechanisms behind it were understood, this rapid bone growth could potentially be adapted to treat injuries in humans. Researchers from China have made progress in this field. They were able to identify the stem cells that are responsible for this rapid growth. They decided to show their achievement to the world using a rather unconventional experiment. Growing mini antlers on the head of a mouse. Deer shed their antlers every spring. And by early fall they have a new set of antlers. This bony structure growing from the frontal bone of deer can grow up to about 3 cm a day. Which is one of the fastest bone growth rates among mammals. Chinese scientists from Northwestern Polytechnical University in Xi'an managed to identify the stem cells responsible for this rapid growth. By implementing them in mice. They grew antler-like structures on their foreheads. All this to better understand the capabilities of newly identified cells in the context of regeneration, which in turn may be useful in the development of new therapies for the regeneration of broken bones, and perhaps also in the regeneration of organs. Some mammals' antlers grow at an average rate of 2.75 cm per day at their peak. As you can clearly see, this tissue regenerates extremely quickly. This also provides an opportunity to take a closer look at how mammals in general are able to regenerate their cells. Antlers are particularly noteworthy in this context. Because mammals have largely lost their ability to regenerate organs and most types of tissues. In turn, a deeper understanding of the process of regular antler reconstruction could potentially have important implications for medicine. As it could open up new possibilities in the context of the regeneration of broken bones. But how did scientists manage to make mice grow something resembling antlers? Researchers delving into the mechanisms behind antler regrowth have identified many genes and cells that play a role in this process. Ten days before the next antler was shed, scientists managed to identify a type of stem cells that were extremely active in the antler regeneration process. Interestingly, they remain in the deer's antlers for a short time after they are shed. After identifying the different stages of antler growth, researchers collected the stem cells that had the greatest potential for reconstruction. The best moment for this turned out to be the fifth day after shedding the horns. They were then rolled out in a petri dish and finally implanted on the mouse's head. After about 45 days, they actually started growing something like small horns on their heads. Which showed that the implanted cells had transformed into bone tissue which is important for the regeneration of broken bones. A better understanding of the processes responsible for the rapid regrowth of antlers may have medical implications due to the possibility of regenerating broken bones. However, the road to this is long. We definitely should not expect that the results of these studies will automatically translate into the rapid development of a method for better treatment of fractures. Doctors would have to deal with a number of potential problems beforehand.
biological vessels for liquid nitrogen. What are their characteristics and how to choose the right one? The popularity of liquid nitrogen is constantly growing. And the properties of this compound turn out to be very valuable, including in science, medicine and veterinary medicine. Thanks to this substance, you can quickly freeze and then easily store biological resources such as cells, tissues or gametes. However, to make this possible, biological vessels for liquid nitrogen are needed. By reading this article, you will learn, among others, what are the characteristics of these containers and how to choose the right ones. Liquid nitrogen vessels, also called dewars, are specialized containers intended for transporting and storing this demanding substance. It is worth noting that this compound requires extremely low temperatures. Dewars available on the market, although they work on a similar principle, are slightly different. The basic division includes transport dewar vessels, intended for transporting and storing liquid nitrogen. Biological dewar vessels, used in the transport and storage of biological materials. Biological liquid nitrogen vessels differ from transport dewars primarily in that they are equipped with special containers called canisters. This is where frozen material is placed. They enable trouble-free access to biological resources and provide them with appropriate conditions. When choosing a biological vessel for liquid nitrogen, it is crucial to match the container to your needs. As we have already mentioned, dewars differ, for example, in capacity. This is a factor that affects their mobility, as well as how long liquid nitrogen stays in the container. Individual vessels may also have a different number of canisters. The more there are, the more samples can be stored in a given dewar. Importantly, in the case of biological vessels intended for use in science, medicine or veterinary medicine, there is no room for compromise. The containers must be solid and have the required certificates. Therefore, it is best to use the services of a supplier experienced in the industry who enjoys good opinions among other specialists. Too much salt can interfere with the functioning of the immune system. Eating too much salt, which is common in many Western societies, is not only harmful to the cardiovascular system, but may also adversely affect the immune system, according to a recent study. Western societies tend to overuse salt. We know that salt can have a harmful effect on our cardiovascular system and our blood pressure. And the list of reasons why we should avoid it has recently grown again. Including a factor that is crucial for the functioning of our body. Scientists have found that salt can affect the so-called regulatory T-cells, TREG, impairing their metabolism. Research carried out by scientists has proven that salt can negatively affect a system that is crucial for our functioning. It's about the immune system. But what exactly could this be? Well, a few years ago, a team of scientists showed that excessive salt consumption can negatively affect the functioning of immune system cells such as monocytes and macrophages, to such an extent that they are no longer able to perform their functions normally.
Specifically, salt disrupts their metabolism and energy balance. And what's worse, salt can even disrupt the functioning of our mitochondria. With this information, scientists decided to investigate whether salt abuse could also affect the ability of adaptive immune cells, such as regulatory T cells. Understanding this potential effect of salt is important because T cells play a key role in the functioning of our immune system. It is not without reason that they are sometimes called the immune police. This is because they suppress the autoreactive immune response and ensure that it remains within reasonable limits and does not lead to damage in our own body. Disturbances in the functioning of T-cells are associated with the occurrence of autoimmune diseases. Until now, scientists knew that salt could affect the functioning of monocytes and macrophages as well as mitochondria in patients suffering from autoimmune diseases. It was also known that salt overuse could cause the T-cells themselves to behave as they do in these conditions. However, the problem was to determine exactly how this was done. Previous research has shown that even a short-term disruption of mitochondrial function may have long-term consequences for the regulatory abilities of T-cells. However, the element that disrupts their functioning in the case of salt turned out to be sodium. Specifically, it affects cellular metabolism by interfering with mitochondrial energy production. This appears to be the first step towards modifying the function of T-cells, which then begin to behave in the abnormal manner mentioned above. There are many indications that excessive salt consumption may significantly impair the functioning of cells that are key to our immunity. This potentially leads to the conclusion that salt may also play an important role in the context of many diseases. However, here it will be necessary to conduct more detailed research.